The lights will go. Oh, yeah, 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 we've got the lights. Fantastic. So, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of the Moments of Wonder Talks at the 2023 Great Exhibition Road Festival. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm Helen Sharman, and I'll introduce you to the panel for this first session um, shortly. It's called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Revealing Earth's Final Frontier. However, first, the important health and safety notice. So in the event that the fire alarm sounds, please do not collect belongings from the cloakroom. Instead, you need to head to the nearest emergency point, um, which will be to your left or to your right. So those are the exits, whether you're down in the theatre or up in the balcony. Um, and the Royal Geographical Society team will guide you away from those exits to the emergency points. So if that's understood, um, I'm delighted to move on to our exploration of the ocean depths today and um, the technologies that will help us to go where no human has gone before. And to do this, I'm delighted to be joined um, by four guests for this panel discussion, initiated by Imperial College London's Security, Science and Technology um, Institute. We're recording the panellists today, um, but not anything of the audience, so you don't need to be concerned about cough splutters or your questions at the end, um, for a special edition of the Zero Pressure podcast that I host. Now, um, Zero Pressure is presented by the same Institute of Security, Science and Technology and Saab, and it looks at how science and technology positively can contribute to complex, interrelated global challenges of today and tomorrow. And today, of course, we're turning our attention to the Earth's oceans. Now, when we think of the sea and the sea floor, I mean, I think they can feel very distant from our day-to-day -day lives. Though, of course, they cover well, over two-thirds of our planet. Um, very obvious when you look at the Earth from space. Um, here's the Pacific Ocean that you can see. You know, some might say that it's easier to live in space than it is to live under the sea. I mean, if you think about it, you have the same need for the life support systems. Um, but certainly at depth, there's a huge pressure differential between the inside and the outside of the submarines. There's no light outside to guide you. And you've got all that corrosive salt water to eat through the seals that help to keep the sea out from your inside. But of course, the seas are utterly essential for modern society. 90% of the world's trade, 90% is conducted by sea. The digital economy relies on deep sea cables that connect countries and continents via the sea floor. In fact, these deep sea cables connect 99% of global telecommunications traffic. All our phone calls and the internet, of course. But we can do so much more than deep sea cables. And there are many opportunities for science and technology to completely transform how we use the seafloor. I mean, scientific sensors could help us track climate change. We could transmit energy from offshore wind turbines or even collect geothermal energy from rifts on the seabed. But with opportunity comes risk. Now, how can we take advantage of the ocean in new ways without polluting it further or exacerbating climate change? How will the seabed feature, perhaps, in future conflicts and security more generally? Submarines aside, I'm sure you all remember the recent sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. Now, underlying all this, of course, is the need to map the oceans in fine detail. And the first concerted effort to map the seafloor was the Challenger expedition. You see here um, the Challenger, HMS Challenger. Um, 1872, this expedition was. And in the 151 years since, we've still only mapped a quarter of the oceans. Now, for context, that's as if Asia was the only continent in the world to be mapped. I mean, 90% of Mars and the entire moon's surface, the entire moon's surface has been mapped. 90% of Mars, right? But only a quarter of the ocean floor. But knowing the depths and the terrain of the seafloor is essential for building underwater infrastructures and vessel navigation, for understanding the processes like ocean circulation and environmental change, and for predicting the tides and natural hazards like tsunamis. Now, before we get started proper, I'd like to remind you all here that this is interactive later on, so there'll be time for questions during the second half of this event. Please do get thinking what you'd like to ask the panel here. Um, don't worry, your questions will not be included in the final zero pressure 
podcast episode that we're going to create from some of the answers that we have today. But if that's all okay, um, let's get started by meeting our panel. Now, we're in no particular order, um, Abby Wilson here in the orange dress there. Abby is curator of transport and mobility at the Science Museum, um, responsible for the water and road transport and navigation collections, covering everything from submarines to sledges, I understand, Abby. Absolutely, everything transport. She spends her days thinking about the vehicles we use to get around and how they relate to the environment and our lives. Uh, Professor Jenny Collier, at the end, um, is Professor of Marine Geophysics at Imperial College London with broad interests in geology, geophysics and geodynamics. She specialises in marine methods and often goes to sea on expeditions to collect data that has transformed our understanding of Earth science, including the process by which the island of Britain became isolated from continental Europe. So we might just get onto that, Jenny, if we're lucky. Uh, Commander Chris Laid next to me, um, blue and white shirt, um, has spent over 40 years in the field of underwater defence, an experienced diver. He joined Saab Dynamics 10 years ago as their underwater defence specialist, looking at the defence application of commercial unmanned underwater vehicles to the military domain. And I understand, even though in space we talk about crewed and uncrewed, we have to talk still about unmanned when it comes to underwater. Apparently that's a thing. Um, so um, we do mean hu non, not human, but we, the general term is unmanned. So that's what I'm going to stick with today. And last but not least, um, in the blue jacket there, Commander Michael Brasser is Saab Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer. Now, Michael was the founder and first Commodore of the US Navy's Task Force 59, a first of its kind organization dedicated to the rapid integrating, integration of robotics and artificial intelligence into Fifth Fleet operations. That's all the operations around um, the Arabian Peninsula. And I should say, Michael, not only um, were you a past guest on Zero Pressure podcast, I believe we spoke particularly about human and machine interfaces then, didn't we? Um, but Michael only started working for Saab after he agreed to be a member of this panel, so we haven't consciously stacked the panel in favour of Saab, honest. But I'm going to start off by um, asking Jenny a question first up. Um, now, you know, in this... You know, over 150 years since that original Challenger expedition started mapping the seafloor. And I understand they actually did it by lowering ropes with weights on the bottom so Absolutely. that we could actually see the depth. Now, we don't do it like that now. So what technologies do we use now to map the oceans? Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're seeing here the, you know, the, the map of what we've achieved today. And of course, you say map the oceans, it's, it's all about the resolution so you know what's the problem on earth the problem is the water layer so typically if you go to another planet so for example moon you know you can map it to a to a high resolution using a satellite but on on earth the satellite energy that you're going to emit doesn't get through the water so we can map the earth with a satellite but we can only get a sort of resolution of about four kilometers so that's you know, that's very fine if you're looking at the whole of the Atlantic, but if you want to do anything more detailed, you actually have to get the sensor into the water. And the problem is the water is just a very good absorber of energy. So we use, you know, acoustic energy. So you sort of have to go on a boat. And so what you're seeing here with all these sort of purple lines are the ship tracks. So, you know, no surprise, there's lots of lines coming out of Hawaii. So the ship has started in Hawaii and then gone out in the Pacific, for example. So unless you've actually had a ship there, you haven't got a, a data point less than four kilometres. So all the, the black bits on the map haven't been, you know, a ship with the right equipment hasn't been there. So this is all echo stuff, is it? So they send us a, a sort of like an acoustic sound, a, a, a noise, and then they look at how that comes back. A absolutely. So it's the same thing that you'd use for a satellite, which would bounce off the sea surface or, or the solid, or, you know, the ground. But in the sea, you have to use lower frequencies, so acoustic. But is, um, is, is, there, is there anything else we can use apart from just sonar? It seems still a very sort of um, rough technique somehow. Um, it's rough, but actually, I mean, measuring the, you know, the elevation is sort of a very fundamental measurement you'd want to make. I mean, you're not, you're not going to go walking up a hill without knowing how high it is. So it's a, it's a very first order measurement. And, you know, the multi-beam sonar, so, you know, most of the multi-beam systems are put on the, the hulls of vessels. 
But of course, if you want to go to higher resolution, and mapping's all about your, you know, your pixel size that you end up in your map. And so if you want to get higher resolution, you put it on something that can go down into the water so column. It's a multi-beam then, so it's not just one, one beam that, of, of that's sound. Right. You're using a whole array. Yes. So sometimes we call it mowing the lawn. So you, you basically have a swathe of information, um, a swathe of sonar um, pings coming out that enables you to get 100% coverage compared to you know, a two-dimensional line, which you would have done previously. Mowing, mowing the lawn. So mowing the lawn. Here, here first. <laughs> yes. So, Abby, when we, you know, for many years, I mean, manned submersibles have been the, the way what we've really used to explore the oceans. Um, but when we think of modern submarines, I mean, I, I certainly think of something very slick and high-tech, um, something probably very large, although perhaps for many people still rather claustrophobic. Now, the Science Museum has got some wonderful examples, hasn't it, of some early manned submersibles. What was it like to actually operate those vehicles, and, and how were they actually used for ocean exploration? So they would have been very claustrophobic. I mean, we're talking really small vessels. Um, most of them are a matter of a few metres in each dimension. So, and, and some of those then have multiple crew inside. Um, so really quite small. Um, I mean, we have one um, a Mantis submersible, which had um, one crew member and they had to lie on their belly, and the external volume of that submersible is less than six cubic metres. Smaller than a little spacecraft. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I certainly would feel really, really claustrophobic in there. Um, I mean, to be honest, with, with submersibles, like the, the technology has improved to enable them to get bigger. Um, but they tend to, when we're talking sort of um, scientific manned submersibles, they, t they still are relatively small um, compared to submarines, um, which are used for sort of like the, the naval side of things. So um, generally, if I'm, if I'm talking about a submersible, I'm talking about something that requires a support ship or platform rather than something that can go out from harbour and back on its own. Okay. So something that's very small. So some of the early ones were actually tethered to the ship, um, and others can go down on their own. But, um, yeah, they're, they're sort of... Generally, um, the visibility of the early ones is not amazing, so you might have sort of one porthole or, or sort of several, but now they can make... Um, than with acrylic hulls, so you're sort of in this little clear plastic bubble that you can see through, which gives amazing um, visibility for observation. Um, but the early ones that we have often have sort of um, manipula manipulator arms, so they could go down and move things around. Ours are all um, related to sort of commercial enterprises, particularly the expansion of North Sea oil in the... 1960s and 70s, so they were going and um, surveying the seabed for locations for um, uh, putting installations and infrastructure, um, but also um, monitoring and surveying infrastructure that was already down there and doing repairs. So you talk about commercial. I mean, Chris, I think even the Challenger expedition probably was doing what it was doing because of a commercial interest in laying sort of telegraph cables across the Atlantic. I mean, what critical infrastructure do we have now on the seabed? OK, I, I think it's true, you know, the driver behind a lot of this exploration is financial, commercial. Um, the, the infrastructure that we have now on the seabed, if you go back from what Challenger was doing, which was laying communications cables... We still have communications cables on the seabed, but they are far more extensive. So 97% of um, internet communications uh, come over the seabed. Um, in addition to cables that deliver data, uh, there are cables out there that deliver power, energy. Um, uh, so those are two aspects. And the other aspect is a, a, a sort of largest factor is the oil and gas commercial business. 
and the delivery of oil and gas through pipelines, but more than that, the operation of oil and gas companies and the infrastructure they need to conduct that operation, all of which can be sensitive to a range of different problems, not least of which the, the, the environment itself. But going forward, I think it will be the commercial world that drives additional infrastructure, the sort of... Um, we've, we've seen now, obviously, the uh, wind farms. Wind farms produce energy. They need to get that energy ashore. They need to be controlled. And the way to do that is through underwater cabling. Right. So it's important to remember when we talk about energy that we're not just talking about oil and gas. No, absolutely. Yeah. And more, and obviously, as we move to a greener environment, the, 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 the ability to deliver tidal energy is another example, where you can generate the energy, but you've got to get that energy ashore. So you're going to need to trans, transmit that energy. We talk about um, fish farms, fish farming. That It's all underwater infrastructure or marine infrastructure that we're talking yeah, about here. Okay. And it's driven very much by the commercial world. Yeah. Although from a defence perspective too, of course, defence needs to communicate and they use similar cables to communicate. There might be a special cable with a high security, but that therefore makes it potentially vulnerable to attack. Mm. And then again, sensor systems that you might want to deploy onto the seabed to deliver a picture of what's going on in your backyard from a defence perspective. So that makes me think, Michael, mm. so um, ex-Navy, um, mm. US Royal Navy, um, but as important as infrastructure is, I think there are many other ways, other things we can learn from an understanding mm. of the oceans, aren't there? And you've been doing a lot of work with um, sensors. So tell mm. us a bit more about this digital ocean concept. Yeah, thank you, Helen. And it's, I think it's very fitting, you know, that we have an astronaut kind of pushing us to discover more about the oceans. And as Chris mentioned, there's a huge sort of economic impact here. For me, you know, like you, I grew up on an island. I made my living on the world's ocean. And for me, it's the oceans that connect us all, power the global economy, and now are primed for innovation and discovery. There's a recognition here that, uh, as we've sort of highlighted, um, just how valuable the oceans are, not only to our economies, but to our security. And so then there's a desire to protect this critical uh, asset. And, but in order to protect it, you need to see it. And so we, at NATO, uh, I used to work at the U.S. mission to NATO and was part of the NATO Maritime Unmanned Systems Initiative. And we started iterating on this idea of a digital ocean. So the entering argument is the recognition just how important the oceans are and a desire to protect them, a desire to see them in order to protect them. So we looked at this holistically from seabed to space, and, and I think we'll cover those domains here. And what we were endeavoring to do was leverage uh, existing sensors from seabed to say, space, uh, and then weave in exciting new maritime robotics above, on, and below the water, fuse that data, and then exploit that data with machine learning and artificial intelligence to go beyond, in the military, what we call maritime domain awareness towards maritime domain cognition. And understanding so rich of the maritime environment that we aren't just aware of what's happening, we are anticipating and preventing malign activity from happening. So, you know, for me, I was most recently focused on the waters surrounding the Arabian Peninsula, and there's a lot of malign activity, everything from piracy to illegal fishing, but also you have one-way uh, weapons shipments, and, and so there's a desire to understand so you can prevent malign uh, activity from happening, and you can keep those critical choke points open for commerce. So that's the, that's the perspective I come at it with. Um, in addition to, you're also gathering key data uh, about the environment itself, which be, can be so helpful in solving the climate issue. So you said see to protect, but you don't mean see with your eyes, do you? uh, I mean see with every sense we have, all the senses. Um, and so eyes, ears, nose, you know, uh, any, anything that can gather information uh, about our world's oceans 
is valuable to protecting them. So you're sending sensors under, underwater. Um, yes. And um, tell me a bit more about the, um, the, the, the up-to-date technologies, the AI stuff that you can use with it. Yeah, so really, uh, while the, the data points are interesting in themselves, and you can see them here, what's most interesting is when all you, these disparate data points come together, and then you're able to leverage machine learning and AI to detect patterns. Uh, and then, you know, patterns that possibly humans couldn't detect. And then you start to, you know, project forward what these patterns mean. And so this is the real interesting thing of all these sensors coming together. And we actually, you know, we at uh, Task Force 59, we actually uh, delivered, um, you know, four digital ocean prototypes while I was there. I, my, my chief technology officer would say two prototypes and two minimal viable products. So we did what I just uh, talked about. And it's, it's early days, but you're starting to see the value of all of that information coming together on a, on a single pane of glass. So it's really I, fascinating to me how we're, sort of, we're getting, we've talked about satellites, Dan mentioned satellites, and we've gone down to, sort of down to the depths, um, and now we're almost sort of coming back again to get a, an overall understanding. But Jenny, what can we learn about the ocean and, and the ocean floor um, through unmanned underwater vehicles that perhaps we couldn't through you know, your multi-beam sonar, for instance? Yeah, so I guess the... the the big problem that we have with multi-beam is you need a mothership. So in other words, scientists go somewhere. As soon as you go unmanned, of course, you have the possibility that you can leave your instrument you know, for long periods when you're not there on the vessel sort of monitoring things. And so you know, one application, so I'm a geologist in terms of you know, understanding the seafloor, so you know, marine hazards is something that autonomy could be really useful for. So as we go into you know, climate change and sea level rise, a lot of the shelves that around our, our continents may well become unstable as they get, you, know, you put 10 meters more water on top of them, that's a large pressure. Um, and in the future, perhaps we'd be able to monitor them by having you know, an autonomous vehicle that could sort of do a, a, a route you know, every three months or something, something that you would never achieve conventionally because you'd need to have a ship go there and so marine science is expensive by its sort of very nature so you know this really opens up the possibilities that we can do all this science without a research vessel. Just tell us why it's why this business about the shelves being unstable is such a big deal. Well so it's a big deal because of sea level rise so if you're on the continental shelf and you might you know you might be you know, your current water depth is 100 metres, you're then going to raise it, you know, by 10 metres, and then basically you're changing, you know, the, 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 the direct pressure on the substrate, which, you know, might lead to, you know, it might warm as well. We have lots of gas hydrates, which are basically frozen gas on the continental shelves that could start to melt, and then the whole system... You know, I don't want to be the purveyor of doom, yeah. but you know that things become unstable. And obviously, if you've got a big offshore landslip, you know it's going to affect all of the infrastructure that you've got on the seabed. You know, as well as you know, it might may or may not cause a tsunami, but it's going to have implications right. for, for people. If I could just add a point to one of the things you mentioned about the cost, uh, not only the, the economic cost of exploring, but the environmental costs, and I just, uh, you know, Julie mentioned how expensive ships are, uh, and they also, there's a carbon expense there as well. The first digital ocean prototype we did was a zero carbon solution, so wind and solar powered robotics, you know, discovering. So I think there's a, that's why there's a, such a desire to go, um, you know, unmanned, because not only can you go where humans can't go, but there's they're more affordable. So I just, just wanted to add on to Julie's point there. I'll just pick up on another point, actually, <laughs> and, and that, that's that not just, <laughs> not, not just unmanned, but resident. So um, a vehicle that lives on the seabed. Mm. Uh, and that's where we're going now uh, in the commercial world and uh, elsewhere as well. So you so, talk about lives, but of course this is a completely artificial um, piece of engineering. So there's, uh, there's an engineer can, uh, only an engineer could talk about something living in that, that way. So, well, that? I'm not an engineer, so that's spooky. <laughs> but um, no, the, 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 the point is that it, it, 
the vehicle has power and communications at a site on the seabed and particularly in the area of um, wind farms, which I've spoken about already, um, this is a, a, quite a challenging environment because wind farms at the moment tend to be quite in quite shallow water, which is a, di a difficult environment to operate in. So if you, if you take out the ship, you save money, you save the environment because you're not spending money on fuel. Um, and so it's, it's a much more efficient way of doing business. Yeah. Obviously, you have challenges with a resident vehicle because of the growth bio growth on the vehicle and so forth and you have to maintain it but that's that's a route which um, technology is driving Lovely. us. So resident vehicles um, but Abby um, un unmanned underwater vehicles then have got lots of positives tell me um, what advantages do manned submersibles still have? Well I think the biggest uh, downside from my perspective of a, of a man of a man submersible is that it's it's quite dangerous so unmanned provides uh it takes away a lot of the risk um but there are there's there's something to be said and um a lot of marine scientists and underwater explorers talk about this about being there in person yourself and actually Seeing it, I think um, James Cameron, who is the Hollywood film director, but also um, has done loads of underwater exploration, um, which is two jobs that I didn't really think went together. Um, but he's talked about it as um, uh, sort of like witnessing. So actually being there, and there's, I think there's just something to be said for actually doing marine science in its natural setting. Um, and even with all the technology that we have of um, cameras and, and all of that, actually the, the, the quality is not as good as seeing it with your own eyes. Um, and there's also issues around um, sort of depth perception and, and things so you can see that a lot easier by just turning your head and, and the, it, the visual information changes um, as you do that if you're there but if you've got a camera you have to actually get the camera to move rather than you can't just move your head and while still looking at the, the sort of screen of information so I think it's just both sort of the the physical thing of being there and but also like actually you're getting more sort of observation data out of it. Is there an element of taking a sample? Because I know we talk about when people on the moon, for instance, we're get, yeah. still getting a lot more information because people have been able to go, well, I'll have that sample and that looks a bit more interesting than the one that I thought I was going to take. And if I were a machine, I would have just been programmed to take samples from here, but I'm actually going to take one from over there. Is there something similar going on? Yeah, well, I mean... So remotely operated vehicles and aut autonomous vehicles do take samples. Um, but definitely, I think, like, there is that sort of... If you're not necessarily sure of exactly what you're going to find, then having that ability to change your mind and, and slightly change the plan while you're there is really crucial. And, and we know so little about the deep ocean, as we've discussed. So um, I think... Yeah, there is, there's definitely something in that. Um, obviously, you've, you've got, with unmanned, you've got both remotely operated, so there's someone sort of looking at a feed, and, and you have some ability to change your plan. And then you have autonomous, which is just going on a pre-planned route, yeah. which just has to go where it's been told. So, Michael, uh, you wanted well, to... Yeah, so this is really curious for me. I, we, I wanted to ask you a question. I mean, because discovery is so much a human thing. And, I mean, what we're talking about is discovering the ocean. And, you know, I mean, you discovering space, I think, could be interesting perspective. I, I don't mean to hijack your panel, but oh, no. I, I, I think it's a very human endeavor. And, I mean, when, when Abby was talking, it was very talkful for me, for example, you know, I was on a, on a ship with 8,300 sensors. It was supposed to be fully automatic. I was captain of this ship, but I knew when something was wrong just by my human nature, by my smell, 
uh, before any sensor told me what was something was wrong. So I just, this very human nature about discovery. Yeah, it's so, just an interesting one, isn't it? And that's, uh, certainly the same thing in the spacecraft, you can feel what the spacecraft is doing, almost as though it's alive, which is what Chris alluded to as well. So yeah, there's that, um, w our brains are quite, quite clever actually at, uh, at amassing so much information and we had to have a sort of a, a we can get a sense of what's going on very very quickly um, yeah thank Sorry. you did you want to add to that Chris you no, I would uh, agree I think that, I think you hit the nail on the head though it's dangerous and it's arguably more expensive to send people down so you probably have to be more selective Yes. about when you do it, but there are huge, there are advantages. Okay. Now let, let's, let's move on, because we've got a lovely piece of video, um, because one of the big projects you've been involved with recently um, has been um, actually discovering um, the endurance ship. That, um, um, so let's have a look at this. Talk us through some of the images of, of this. This is Shackleton's ship um, that sank ooh, um, in the late 1800s, didn't it? T tell us what it was like to see these images. Yeah, a, little bit late, a little bit later than that. So it was about 100 years since, the, since HMS Endurance sank. I don't know, we're in the right place, I suppose, in the uh, Royal Geographic Society. But Shackleton um, went down to the South Pole. The, uh, the Endurance was stuck in the ice. The, uh, they got off the ship, the ship was crushed and sank. They took a fix um, and that created a datum. Um, and the year before last, an AUV was set to go out and find so it. AUV means... An autonomous underwater vehicle. So it goes down and does its stuff. It mows the lawn. Um, <laughs> and that's, what, that's, the ter that's the term we use. Um, and it didn't find it. Uh, and then last year we sent down uh, two AUVs, different AUVs. Um, they were called, the, they're called Sabretooth. And um, on, I think, about with three days to go, at 3,012 metres, they found endurance. And uh, I mean, the story of Shackleton's trip and the survival is extraordinary. I spent 14 months living in the Falkland Islands, went down to South Georgia, which is where Shackleton's grave is. Um, he got all his team back. Um, and that, after the ship sank, he sailed across the Weddell Sea, which is probably the most violent sea in the world, in basically an open boat with four of his colleagues, and then scaled South Georgia's mountain range to get to the whaling station and get... Um, Get, get to safety. Get to safety. Yeah, yeah so it's pretty amazing. And there she is. Um, and you can even see uh, in some of the pictures there the, uh, the, the, the sort of rivets on the, on the hull because she was refitted. Her hull was refitted before she sailed down to, uh, down to the ice. They sort of glisten sometimes. It's so clear, isn't it, those images? Yeah. And you used an unmanned vehicle to get yeah, down so here. Yeah, so we go back to, uh, to the Sabretooth, and here, here we see her here. So she's, she's what we call a flat fish vehicle, in that most AUVs tend to be sort of torpedo-shaped because they're more hydrodynamic. That means they have greater range, but they're not very stable. Uh, the advantage of this uh, vehicle is that she's stable in the water column, and therefore, if you're carrying very sensitive sensors, uh, it, it provides a very um, stable platform for you. It's, it's what we call a hybrid vehicle, so it can be an autonomous vehicle and it can be a, uh, a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV. And in the operation to find the endurance, she was operating in the remotely operated mode. So she had a, a pilot on the end who was able to control the vehicle via a um, fibre optic tether. So she has batteries on board. She didn't take power down the tether. And she did an excursion out to 25 kilometres on a fibre optic um, tether. So, yeah, pretty... Yeah, congratulations to the team. Yeah. I mean, some of them look pretty happy. Some of them are, um, look, just look pretty cold, actually. <laughs> 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 But no, I, I do want to move on to, um, to sort of security in, in perhaps in, in the very general sense of the word as well as more specifically. I mean, we've heard a lot about science and technology behind ocean exploration, but as those technologies develop, I mean, nations risk perhaps being left behind if they don't better understand the oceans mm -hmm. um, and how to use them to their advantage. I mean, so, Jenny, tell me a bit about um, energy 
um, security, because that's a really big, a big thing at the moment, particularly. I mean, what, what role does underwater mapping have um, for our energy in the future? It is. So, I mean, if, I mean, if you think about the minerals that we're, you know, metals we're going to need to, you know, really drive the green economy going, going forward, the oceans are actually one of the places that concentrate metals. So, for example, there are manganese nodules on the seabed, and, and those are quite widely spaced. We also, of course, have um, black smokers, things concentrating copper. And it's quite controversial currently about, you know, how you might mine these, because obviously the other thing that they go with is the biology reserves. So and black so smokers are vents, are they? They're vents, yeah. So it's basically hot water which concentrates metals. Um, I mean, that's a, you know, so they're a very good source of copper. And, you know, we might need to look at other types of reserves as we go forward. But no, understanding sort of the, the, the biological reserves as well, of course, you know, in terms of future pharmaceuticals, it's quite likely that there are marine organisms which will help, you know, provide us solutions in the future for, you know, various uh, medical needs we might, might have. And it's because our understanding is so poor. I mean, every time, as a scientist, you go to sea, you literally discover something. I mean, it's really why... I feel so spoilt, it's why I stayed in marine science, because there's always discovery, including the project you described about Island Britain. I mean, we discovered something off the Isle of Wight. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And so it really does have that sort of link with space travel, because there is so, it's so poorly known. Yes. So we always discover things. And because our knowledge isn't complete yet, you know, that's really hopefully what drives it in terms of looking for resources that we'll need in the future. Very briefly, very, very, yes. what did you discover off the Isle of Wight? So the Isle, yeah, so our discovery off the Isle of Wight was, for a long time, it was unclear when, basically when the channel opened. And so this is particularly our colleagues in the Natural History Museum who looked at early man. So through the ice ages, as you imagine, as it got cold, early man migrated into um, Europe and then back again as it warmed up. And there was a period where there was just a population crash, as if something had happened to stop the early migrations. And what we discovered is that there was this huge catastrophic flood terrain in the English Channel, which had basically breached the, the chalk barrier. So I can't say this very briefly, at the Straits of Dover. But it was all there, sitting... So I say this... We had a project, it was all to do with look, looking for aggregates. So it was nothing, we never proposed that we were going to find this flood. I mean, people would have laughed at us. We would never have got funded. Right, so that's how we and, are now an island. Britain and that's is an how island. we're an island. So basically we severed the, the Straits of Dover. Yeah. But it was all sitting there and we, we discovered it in 2005. And, you know, I've worked in many exotic places, but perhaps the biggest, my biggest discovery was off the Isle of Wight. <laughs> Lovely. But it's just an illustration of how poorly we know our, our, you know, even our very coastal yeah, waters. Yeah. So, Chris, the dual-use technologies, I'm thinking um, civil and military, I mean, that's become quite a, a big thing for many organisations. It's a really perhaps a driving philosophy quite often these days. Um, your work at Saab Dynamics focuses very much on commercial unmanned underwater vehicles and how they might be applied to the military domain, I think. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I think the point is that um, whilst navies used to lead the way in arguably underwater technology and submarines and things, I think that with the, the sort of birth of what we've been discussing, the commercial work that goes on on the seabed, the commercial world now very much is the leader. They have the experience. And recent events... Um, in the last 12 months or so, particularly the Nord Stream, which you've already alluded to, um, very much sort of um, navies now are having to rely on commercial companies to support them in how they deliver the effect that they need to do to protect things like the Nord Stream pipeline uh, and so forth. Um, and I think that the, one of the fundamental things from a, uh, if you look at sort of big picture commercial vehicles, uh, the vehicles themselves are just treated as trucks, um, be it uh, an autonomous vehicle or a, 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 an unmanned vehicle, they're treated as a truck. And you put on, and this dates me, but for those of you that remember Thunderbirds, a bit like Thunderbird 2, 
you put on the pod that you want to use, exactly, <laughs> you put on the pod that you want to use for the job you want to do. So, to use a slightly less Thunderbird term, they're modular, okay? And I think that um, navies in the past, their vehicles have tended to be one role specific, under the water. I'm not talking about submarines, I'm talking about remotely operated vehicles. They would do something for mine countermeasures, for example, and that's what they did. So one of the things we've been looking at is the ability to adopt that sort of concept, that commercial concept of the modularity, so that you just buy the truck, and when the new, when the new sensor comes along, you put a new sensor on it. It's not integrated you know, implicitly into the vehicle and you can't change it and turn it around. So I think that's, that's one aspect uh, that, we're, that we're working at. But I've already mentioned underwater residency. Um, and one of the things you need to deliver in defence um, as we go forward to sort of protect our underwater infrastructure is persistence. And following on from vehicles that live on the seabed, that delivers you persistence. So if you've got a, a sensor network around your critical infrastructure with some form of robot on the seabed that can respond to, it can be cued by those sensors when something happens, that robot can go out and investigate who's in your backyard. And persistence, you mean keeping on doing yeah, it? Yeah, so you, you, you're there all the time. Yes. It's like the it's a sentry. You know, the guy that stands on the gate, um, but he needs to stand on the gate at, 3,000 metres in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah, not, not such a pleasant challenge. Yeah, quite. <laughs> Michael, uh, Ukrainian Navy, um, we've heard quite a lot about what they've been doing um, using underwater vehicles mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Black Sea recently. Mm -hmm. um, what role do unmanned underwater vehicles have in, in sort of current defence and, and in the future as well? Yeah, I think, uh, I think and actually Chris sort of touched on this, you, you, when you're talking about defense, you're actually endeavoring to deter war. Now, in the case of Ukraine, uh, the war has, you know, been brought upon them unjustly. So they are, what they've been able to do with unmanned is actually keep the Russian Navy at bay using unmanned systems, right? They did a, a pretty daring attack and it's basically neutralized the Russian Navy. They've also been doing a pretty, um, you know, innovative things over land with unmanned systems. So you can see the, the outsized return on investment of what these systems can provide in terms of defense. Uh, in terms of deterrence and actually preventing a war, um, to Chris's point, you, you want a potential adversary to think two and three times about taking an aggressive action against you. You want them to think that their chances of success are slim to none. So what these unmanned systems can do, there's a, there's a quality and quantity. There's, there's, it can really complicate the calculus of an adversary um, deciding whether or not they want to make an aggressive move on a, on a neighbor. And so that's, that's where I see sort of the future here. And, and obviously the converse is true. An adversary could, could leverage these systems against, against you, against us, the Alliance, in a, in, in a harmful way. So it's, um, yeah, it's, you know, the ultimate goal is to prevent war and to keep our societies safe. It's, you, you know, um, you know, that's, that's our sort of motto at Saab, keeping people and society safe. I did not, uh, you know, I was planning to be here as the former door of Task Force 59, but, you know, it's something that we're all committed to, is keeping people and society safe. And, and one of the key ways to do that is to deter by being such a, you know, hard target, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, finally, just before we come on to audience questions, Abby, tell me a bit about how manned submersibles, um, what they, role they might play in national security. Well, so I think um, everyone is aware that submarines have been used in, in warfare for a really long time um, and still are. Uh, but there is something that if um, 
if the worst happens and, and you do have an accident, which has happened in the, in the past, in order to try and rescue the people on those submarines, you, you do need to ha have manned submersibles to, um, to, to get those submariners out. Um, so there was quite a big um, movement in the late, 20th century, just remembering which century we're in, um, to sort of build up um, submarine rescue forces and um, develop submersibles that could do that job. And actually, you know, we, we've, we've talked about how dangerous it is to send people down to these great depths. And um, this is one of the ways that some of those risks are mitigated a bit. Um, there's also um, vehicles that um, are diver delivery vehicles, so for things like Navy SEALs, um, that they have to be taken in a, in a little pod. Um, so, yeah. So, Chris, when you were a diver, were you ever taken in a little pod? Uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was, actually, yeah. But, um, I mean, so swimmer delivery vehicles. Um, but interestingly, uh, so, so first of all, on the submarine rescue side, those, they're manned because they're trying to get the guys out. So they're actually, the, you know, the vehicle that comes down and, and um, locks onto the submarine is where the, the, the guys in the stricken submarine climb out into. So the, the vehicle itself is manned, but then it's manned with more people because they're the escapees. But from a swimmer delivery vehicle perspective, uh, yes, but uh, even those now are looking at how they might incorporate a, uh, a sort of remotely operated vehicle or an AUV vehicle from autonomous. the swim... Yes, okay. sorry, uh, an autonomous vehicle from that uh, swimmer delivery vehicle or indeed turn the swimmer, swimmer delivery vehicle into an autonomous vehicle. So it's wonderful, isn't it? How technology play tunes yes, on it. we come through. Look, it, it's, I could ask you questions all day, but I do want to give the audience here a chance to ask some questions. Um, so, is, does anybody here in the audience, we've got some roving mics, if you'd like to raise your hand. I mean, I have loads of questions I can still put to our panel if there's nothing burning, but uh, this is your chance to ask. Um, yeah, they've got so a few round and about. So, perhaps I'll let the, 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 um, the mic people, James, you're the only mic person we've got. Thank you. And then we'll come, come up back on this side. Thank you very much. That's great knowledge to share with, uh, with us. You know, thank you very much. And w one, my question about you know, the mapping of the floor, what the parameters are you mapping? Is it temperature, surface, or pH, or you know, you know, any organism or creature? All of those, right? I guess, would be a yeah. simple answer. So marine scientists tend to, there tend to be people who work on the water column. So particularly, you know, they'd be measuring um, how much chlorophyll there is in the water, what its salinity is, and that's very linked to ocean circulation. And then there are people like myself, and so I work, I'm a geologist, so I work on the seabed and below, and then obviously I also work with benthic biologists who are looking at the organisms that are within the geology as well. So you use slightly different sensors depending on what you're doing, and of course... The critical thing is always the pressure and the water depth. And so I'm actually, I work in both deep water and shallow water. And so I guess a bit like having different payloads. So if you've got a submersible, you put different bits of kit depending on, on whether you want to make you know, water samples or whether you want to survey the seabed. So we have to be you know, very sort of multi-faceted, um, if you like. So it's a very good question, all, all of those, all of the above. Mm. Is there another question on this side we can come to, I think? Um, yes, a lady here in the glasses, second row. So, um, I want to ask if, uh, what is the impact of uh, all these activities, all this exploration on wildlife, actually? Like, sending all this technology, because we know, like, the exploration on land is quite damaging to the planet, and we send a lot of trash to the space, so how it may impact, really, what is underwater? Yeah, good one. Wildlife. Does anybody particularly want to go for that? Chris, is that your, uh, your well, field? Uh, uh, well, I can have a go. I mean, I think that... Uh, that, that uh, well, probably... Uh, is it Michael? The end there. Yeah. Want to take it away? I'll have a go. I'll have a go. <laughs> so, you uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you've got the panel there. Uh, well, no, not a wildlife expert, but I think the thing is that most pr pr um, practitioners mm. 
yes. within, on the sea, respect the sea. Now, that's a generalization, and I accept that. I, I, I want to double down on that. Yeah. Uh, Oh, well, go ahead, Chris. Well, no, I was going to hope you're going to back me up. <laughs> they, so I think, yeah, so they have a respect for the sea. If you're a mariner, then you inherently understand the sea. And if you're not, you're not a very good mariner and you probably won't last very long. Yeah. Um, so you have to understand the sea and you have to respect the sea and, you know, and, and what, what we do to the sea. And I think there's so much more of a greater awareness now that, you know, I mean, I probably shouldn't say, but... In the old days when I first started in the Navy, you used to put gash over the side. You don't do that anymore. Gash being rubbish. Gash being rubbish, you know? Thanks uh, for the translation. It, it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, I, I think the point that was made about the marine mining yeah. is the key. You know, what are we going to do to the environment by that? And go on from there, I would say the key is legislation. And there isn't much legislation, legislation at the moment in the sort of when you get out into when you once you go beyond economic zones out of territorial waters through economic zones into the deep open ocean, the, there's not a great deal of legislation. So we need legislation, international legislation. Yeah, it's just like what's happening in space, where we talk about mm. space debris and stuff, yeah. we put the gash of the space out in, in there, and, we, we, and Jenny mentioned as yeah. well the, the marine stuff, all yeah, the, the so diversity. I mean, for example, I'm now, you know, we always take marine, trained marine mammal observers, so I'm, a, I'm one of those, and so exactly that, so I've seen that in my career, so we always do observations for 12 hours before we put objects into the, you know, large vehicles into mm. the the water, which we didn't do, you know, 20 years ago. And so that's a recognition, really, of, of really how we're interacting with the... Well, it's a small yeah. recognition of what we're... So we're very conscious of it. I guess, just to add on Chris' point, you know, it it's goes beyond just respect. It's a love for the ocean. I mean, we, as I mentioned, I grew up on an island. I made my life on the ocean. Uh, there are benign actors, and there are malign actors on the ocean. It is the Wild West. You have overfishing, uh, and, and overfishing leads to other malign activities on the water. So, for example, a lot of the pirates that you see off the Horn of Africa are fishermen who can't catch fish because their waters are being overfished. So they, they have a skill, and they know, you know, they ultimately have to provide for their family, and this is one of the paths they take. Uh, so... I think the benign actors need to need to make bold sort of uh, standards and hold you know sort of the world to those standards about preserving our world's oceans and and I think your question gets at the heart of why all of us have made our living you know in the in the oceans on the oceans. But I guess it's also the understanding, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So we can't get anywhere unless we actually understand mm -hmm. what the ocean mm -hmm. is all about. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Um, how about growing uh, seaweed, vertical seaweed farms for animal um, food? So the question is vertical uh, seaweed farms growing on ropes. Um, it take off pressure from the land instead of growing wheat. Yeah, so a thought, does anybody have any... Any, any comments? Questions? And will there be uh, um, <coughs> arguments between growing uh, seaweed and fishermen? I, I wouldn't... I, 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 can't, future. I can't answer the question specifically about seaweed, but I did mention uh, aquaculture. And I think that, you know, as we talk about what are we, how are we going to use the sea more, the, the delivering food from the sea is going to become much, much more significant, I think it's fair to say. Um, uh, with, again, it's similar to the, the effects we were just discussing. How will, how will mining uh, on the seabed affect the environment? So it, it's all about... Again, I think it's about legislation and, uh, and legislating and having the rules that allow you to do things which aren't going to prejudice the environment. But on the same side... With all that coming into the, into the sea, the sea becomes even more significant than we know it to be. 
and therefore it becomes an area you, you need to protect, not just from an environmental pers perspective, but from a defense perspective too. And, and But it's more than legis just legislation, it's holding people accountable to the legislation. Lovely, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh dear. I know, I know, it goes too quickly. Yes. Um, was there a commercial driver for finding the Endeavour, the Shackleton ship? Because it didn't look cheap. No, no, it was, it was a privately funded um, e uh, expedition. So it was, it was privately funded. Um, and so it... But obviously, with that funding and finding something like that, it's a very good marketing tool as well. So those people involved in it were then able to use it as, well, we've done this and we've found this and so forth. But it was, uh, it was a, a, a private venture. So I am going to go r right at the back there, there was, because it's nice to get some people who uh, from different parts of the audience. Thank you. Hello there. Uh, thank you all for sharing your uh, comments so far. Uh, so at the moment, we've mapped 25% of the ocean. So with all the technology we have now, what's the timeline? What do you envisage the timeline being to, to map the next 25% and then the next 25%? Ooh, that's a good one. Jenny, are you going to start? Yeah, so th I mean, there is a, a target. So it, I mean, obviously, if someone would put more vessels into the activity, that would increase it. But currently, people talk about 25 years to get to a sort of 100 meter resolution. But that's with quite a sustained effort. And that's, yeah. And, and how much of the ocean will we have mapped then? So that would be to try and get all of it to 100 meters. The whole meters. 100% of it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there, are, there have been several initiatives of people trying to, you know, put this as a target. But, I mean, currently, so Ireland has done all of its EEZ, e um, economic zone, but the UK hasn't. You know, we're a maritime nation, and we, you know, we haven't because we haven't prioritised it. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking that those sort of numbers. So, are we back to the economic driver that we were talking about earlier? Will there be a, a commercial driver to that? Well, I mean, if if we're going to use the sea more, then we'll, and we need to know what's on the seabed, then that will drive not just from a, a scientific perspective, but from a, a, a commercial perspective. It will drive a speedier work on the seabed, I think it's fair to say. But, um, yeah, so I think... But it, it, it will only drive it in the areas that it's yeah. commercially viable, so it wouldn't necessarily map the whole ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, and then beyond, you know, the, the commercial from a, you know, national perspective, no one nation can do this on their own. And you start to see NATO, um, you know, take a a larger interest in this. They just stood up a new sort of task force on the seabed. And, you know, that's 31 nations looking to do, you know, something in this space and hopefully soon 32, right, Chris? Yes. Uh, so, but just anyway. Just to extend that question, actually, I think it's quite interesting, I think, to think about what ramifications might there be of us understanding more about the ocean floor? So if we do it for the reasons, the benign reasons, mm -hmm. does that mean that malign actors might take that information and, and use it to, let's say, to mine irresponsibly, the coming back to the environment, or um, uh, for, for some sort of invasion? Yeah, I think there's always that risk. And, and this is the value of persistence that Chris was referring to, because if there's, there, it's almost like the, the the mall camera sort of thing. If you know you're going to get caught, you won't do it, you know? And so there's a deterrence act, uh, act there. And just if an adversary knows they will get caught, if they do a malign activity, perhaps they won't do the malign activity in the first place. That's, the, that's what we see. That's what we saw, sort of saw in the, uh, in the Middle East as we were working around the waters uh, surrounding the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, there's a huge deterrent factor. I think that the other thing is that it, it has been shown that the more data we have on our oceans, the more um, that directly supports calls for protecting them. So without the data, there's been a lot of pushback on marine protection zones and things like that. So um, having that data has directly enabled those sort of sanctuaries and protection zones to be set up. And it also enables those um, governments and bodies that look after those areas to actually 
do the work and set out how it should be managed because they know what's going on and, and they can actually respond accordingly. So, yeah, I think there's, there are risks, but obviously there's also huge benefits to it and, and all the stuff around climate change and being able to map that as well. Thank you. Um, I really do need to let this audience go soon. Does anybody have an absolute burning thing they need to say from the panel? I'm just looking very quickly down. I think you've all answered, been brilliant. Thank you. But no, we, I mean, we've heard about the science and the technologies that might be used, are being used as, right now, to map the oceans. We've had a glimpse into the future as well. Um, we've heard about how science and technology relating to the seafloor and the oceans really positively does contribute to society now and in the future as well. And how that same science and technology presents opportunities and risks. So thank you very much to all of our panel today. We did, we'd have one alibi uh, from this. We're all extremely honored to be on the same stage with you. You're a legend <laughs> here in, in the thank UK. You. And uh, <laughs> we would miss that enough. Thank you. But to Jenny and Michael and to Abby and Chris, thank you. Really, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you today. Apologies, I know there were many questions, and if you had your hand up and you couldn't get, um, get an answer to your question, um, but I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you also to Imperial College London's Institute for Security, Science and Technology, and Jack Cooper for initiating this festival panel, and to Jack for clicking the slides through so skillfully, um, uh, and to the festival organisers, especially James Romero, for coordinating. Um, the festival content news, as you probably know, until six o'clock this evening. So please do get out there and um, explore the full programme of talks, workshops and stands. Otherwise, that's it from me. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.